philosophical superstructure of the universe kind of thing. Okay, Frank. Hey, I'm Frank. That's also my first name. And uh, I've been writing since I was six years old in various <laughs> methods and ways. Um, I just recently retired after 37 years in the workforce, early retirement. Um, my most recent book is uh, Do the Dead Dream. It won a 2017, oh, this one doesn't have a stick on it, um, award for, uh, best book award for fiction short stories. Um, and it's basically uh, it's the best of my work in over 40 years of writing. Most of my work um, has dealt with versions of the afterlife, sleepwalkers, the uninvited, psychic, and then my science fiction one is ERO. There's all some aspect of uh, otherworldly and corporeal content. All right, Jean, over to you. Okay, I've, I've primarily written in urban fantasy. However, I actually had my first sci-fi book published, written with um, a fellow Denverite, um, Jim Schollander. And it's um, a sci-fi sailing adventure. And the second book of this trilogy is going to be published, we're waiting for the, for, the, for the publisher to send us back the proofs now. So it's gonna be coming out soon. But actually I haven't really dealt with the afterlife so much um, in my writing, unless you consider a vampire's afterlife. <laughs> you know? So um, I'm, I'm coming at it, I guess, from a different perspective. Certainly our afterlife. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, even non-writers have to think about it or face sure, it. Sure, absolutely. Or, or avoid it, depending on how they're thinking. Well, about and it. that's why my, my, my answers to the questions are going to be mainly personal opinions rather than what I've written about, um, you know, what I thought about. This is going to be what I think about the afterlife, so. And Mr. Steve. Well, and you, you mentioned non-readers. It was a great segue into me, or non-writers. I am a non-writer. I'm a reader. And I, uh, I already like uh, works that, that uh, investigate, or, or rather, rather uh, 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 take excursions into the afterlife and, and reveal what's there. It, it's Inter there are a lot of really interesting stories out there about that. Certainly been a long-term interest of humanity. So, um, so one of the first questions I want to just toss out is like, well, when I, when I looked at the schedule, the way it worked out, it said Neverland, colon, versions of the afterlife. And I suddenly thought, well, that actually is kind of an interesting thing because what if, you know, James Barry had pulled a little twist at the end, kind of like Lost did, and it turned out that Neverland was the afterlife for the Lost Boys. You know, that we, they weren't vampires, but that they were dead and that their afterlife was staying young forever and this and that. And it's like, would that have been, would that have made sense as much as other things? And would you think of something like that as, as an afterlife, as a heaven, a hell, a purgatory? Who wants to jump in first? Raise your hand. Well, I mean, You're Narnia did that. Yeah. I mean, so the, the Chronicles of Narnia, it, I mean, it wasn't that they found out that they had been dead the whole time, but um, the afterlife definitely comes in there at the very end. Um, as to the larger picture of what would an actual heaven look like, I mean, I think we've spent all of human history pondering it and we're not anywhere cl any closer to the to the answer now than we were 10,000 years ago. Frank, what do you think? Oh, um, well, you know, I, I've just, it's really kind of funny. I've been reading a couple of philosophy books lately. And when I was in college, I studied under a Dr. Uh, William F. Neatman who wrote a book, The Unmaking of God. And it was interesting reading about how philosophy Philosophical thought and religious thought affected each other. I won't, I won't get into that because that's kind of outside the panel, but it's just like people in general are just always curious about what happens beyond what we can see and, and, and live and breathe. And the point of the philosophy and the re religious thought is that philosophical thought's always been more of finding answers and 
And according to Dr. Neatman and what little study of religious philosophy done, religion is supposed to be the study of your our finitude, our, our existence just being who we are. It doesn't necessarily have to answer to you know, um, a definite God or what's beyond. It's how we deal with our lives now. So, I mean, I think when it comes to, you know, books and movies and um, discussions, it's all relating to our finitude. You know, how do we look at our life? How do we look at what it is we're doing, um, how that's going to affect what happens afterward. Um, I don't think there's really any wrong way of doing it, even picking a religious version of it, even though I am not religious. I mean, it's just how people are. It's, it's, there's a reason I feel for why that question comes up, why we keep trying to address that. And I don't believe in a chaotic randomness. I think everything happens for a reason, whether or not we understand it or we'll figure it out in this life. But I think every action, every thought, every emotion has, has an intent to it. And if it's a good intent, it's all about helping our lives, helping ourselves better ourselves in this life. You know, whatever comes afterward, you know, it is, comes. <laughs> it's a cherry on the top. You, all, you can, all you can really be is your best person. And that's a whole nother conversation, given what's going yeah. on. <laughs> well, okay. So, uh, I, I also think one of the reasons why this comes up so often is because nobody, I don't think, wants to think that that this is it. That after you're dead, you just cease to exist. So there's nothing else. Um, and, and you know, I have never, I, I don't really believe in heaven. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in purgatory. But I'd hate to think that this is it, that, that when I'm gone, um, there's nothing else after, there's nothing to look forward to. And I think one of the reasons why, I, I, when my mom passed, passed away, um, I was there at her bedside. And I think one of the reasons that, one of the wonderful things about having a belief in the afterlife is that when she went, it was so peaceful because she firmly believed she was going on to something better, that there was something, there was heaven up there and she was going to it. So um, I think that that nobody ever wants to think that, that this is it, that there's nothing else after this because then you kind of get into the, like Frank was saying, the philosophical or the, or, the, or the moral questions about then what difference does it make how you live this life if there's nothing that comes after it? There have been, I just read an article um, in preparation for this panel about near-death experiences, um, but there have been, obviously there's always research into this. I think this article is a couple years old but it, it was uh, talking about how it, it covered the breadth of investigations and uh, subjects. So, I mean, a lot of the people that were involved, I mean, they, they, were, every, they were like mechanics, you know, scientists, smart people, average people, every, and, and it didn't matter what their beliefs were. It didn't matter if they were on drugs. That, the only thing that really seemed to matter if there was like an inherent problem with the brain that was affecting something that might affect if an NDE was experienced. Obviously, they had to come back and talk about it, right? So they didn't die at that point. But there was a ton of research done into it. And it's, it's you know, it's a standard, the tunnel, the light, and then whatever being comes. Um, but, um, you know, the range of, um, of, of, of uh, motion and love that was felt and being able to like depart your body and see things other other places. I mean, uh, I haven't read this particular book. I've read other books that this article was on, but it seemed like a pretty compelling book. It's pretty uh, well researched, mm -hmm. according to the Huff, Huff Post. Uh, Huff, Huff okay. Post article. Well, I'm going to kind of wrench us into more of the the literary end because, man, the whole near death and that, that could be. A huge yeah. panel of symposium, but um, just different versions of the afterlife. And certainly, ever since from like Heaven Can Wait to What Dreams May Come to Constantine, there have been lots, or going back to Dante, 
you know, there's been lots of literary versions. So um, I can ask you to take a, take a second and think of either a movie or a book that for you, whether you thought it was the best version or the or version you'd want to be involved with, but one that was memorable of like either a heaven, a hell or whatever. And I see Emily was raising her hand, so. Cause I figure everybody else can want to, I, I claim the good place or I get to talk about the good place. <laughs> Because it's uh, it's the most recent one, you know. So my my um, education, my background is in. I did my undergrad in philosophy, politics, and economics, and I did my then I went to law school. Um, and what do those all have to do with each other? They have to do with humans' artificial constructs that we live within that confine our lives. You can actually probably argue that with almost any field of study, but those are the most interesting to me. Humans are a fascinating creature that live. We live in a world of ideas. Like everything that we're looking at right now started as an idea um, and we bring more you know complex and abstract ideas into reality um, and to into reality type spaces than than any other species i think the most interesting um writings on the afterlife and I, I say this as a very devoutly religious person but i think what matters the most to us now is what the afterlife says about who we should be now what is the best kind of person to be what is the optimal what is what should we should be striving for and whether it's something that we can sustain and find joy in eternally or whether it's this idea of causing the least amount of pain to the people around us if we were given it um, unmatched power it's that dialogue that's really interesting that to me makes the afterlife worth thinking about is not what actually happens should we die because you only spend as i say you only spend about one last day of your life on your deathbed um what does it mean to us now in how we live? Well, I, I hate to live my life thinking that, it, that this is just, uh, I, I'm saving up chits for when I'm no longer here. Right. I think I should be a good person because there's immediate reward for being a good person. Yes, exactly. And yeah, but I mean, I would argue that the afterlife is an idealized version of the world where, you know, even if you think of you know what it is to be good, I think you recognize that this world has a lot of noise in it. Doing the right thing doesn't always lead to good things. But the afterlife is a more idealized, sterilized version of, and it is often, I think, a heaven-like model that we are using when we think this was a good thing to do. And if the world was a good place, it would always work out well. But I'm doing it for a higher reason as opposed to, yeah, saving up chits for, for an afterlife. Can I? And I kind of look at it uh, a little differently where there is constant interplay between both. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily look at it as I live this life X to Y and then yeah. Z plus one on is separate. I see that whatever, I, I see it's kind of like the analogy I, I think of is sticking your hand through like a, a piece of plastic, a rubber and you push it, you know, you get the impression on the other side. So the other side is, is the incorporeal and what we're seeing as the corporealism is a muted, distorted version. I don't want to use distorted, but that's what I can come up with now. Of what's going on the other side of that barrier. So I think there's a definite give and play uh, between the two of them. And it's just life and death are just transitions to an energy flow. But to get back to Rose's question, um, one of the, the books that I, I think uh, really, really uh, made an impression on me when I was a teenager and started reading all this stuff was the what's called the Oversoul Seven Trilogies, which was written by Jane Roberts, who, if, you, if you've ever heard of her, she worked with her husband, Rob Butts, and they did some channeling to an entity called Seth, who was supposed to be a teacher. Here nor there, that book, those those three books, I found very interesting as a way to construct or, or uh, perceive what how this might be living back and forth between it. But along with that book on, on how how it details that stuff pretty specifically, I really loved uh, Slaughterhouse Five and the Brief History of the Dead for different reasons. But Slaughterhouse Five, I thought, was great because it was it was. It was messing with you. It was messing with time. It had author intrusion. I mean, it had everything you're not supposed to do when you're writing a book cohesively structured. And that book really had a, 
had an impact on me because I read the Oversoul, I had read the Oversoul books first. And I thought, man, that's a cool idea. And I always liked writing weird stuff. And I and I read Slaughterhouse Five in high school, and it was like, wow, so you can write about this weird stuff like that. And that's what <laughs> re really I think that was probably uh, the four most powerful books. Yeah. Uh, Jane, what about what about you and any books or movies or anything that sort of really stuck in your head? Well, there are actually two. Um, and the first is um, Defending Your Life, the <laughs> yes. Albert Brooks movie. I absolutely love that because I always thought if that's not the way it is, that's the way it should be. Um, so I, I, I love the idea that you go to a, like a holding place and, and, you know, and, and you're judged, which is, you know, nobody likes to be judged, but you, you either have to go back and do it again, or you get to move on. Um, and I, I, I just thought that's a wonderful concept. And if I, if I believed in an afterlife, I'd like it to be like that. The other one was a television series called Dead Like Me. Yeah. Now that, that's yeah. <laughs> another one that I absolutely loved because um, it was so, you know, it, it, it was just so human. I mean, I, I don't know. Dead, yeah, some, I, I just see that someone says dead like me. It's one yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Um, because he, he was, you know, here was a very young girl who was killed by a, a, a piece of space garbage, a toilet that falls out of the sky and, and kills her. And she becomes a reaper. So she is the one that, that guides. When people die, she guides them to the afterlife. But the, but the thing I like most about that program is the idea that in one episode, they had to go through the files of everyone's last um, thoughts and you know like 90 percent of them were regrets so to me it meant it, it just it just resonated with me it was like you need to do what you need to do in this life you know i you don't want your last thought to be oh god i should have told them that or i'm sorry i didn't do this or you know it's it's just so those are those are were two um media um, presentations that I really liked um, and they just spoke to me because I thought if that's not the way it is as I said this is the way it should be yeah I, I, think I, I identify with the Albert Brooks character in defending your life <laughs> yeah oh. <laughs> I think many of us are more identified with that than the uh Meryl Street. <laughs> yeah I would oh probably gosh. be in the C-class hotel in the <laughs> uh, part of what you were saying Jean just remind me I mean you may be one of the few people who won't go Irma Bombeck, who's Irma Bombeck? But oh, um, I know who Irma Bombeck is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I not that long ago watched um, like a PBS special on her. And uh, she was a, a, a humor writer right. back before there were really humor writers. She had a huge following. And of course she fought um, cancer right. and, and then eventually it got her. But one of her last columns she wrote about um, what she'd always hoped it would be when she went up to heaven, where they would say, it's like, do you have anything left? Any little bits of talent you didn't use? Any of this, that, mm -hmm. or the other thing? And she said her dream was that she would say no. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. I used everything. I told everybody everything. I'm as naked and empty as the day I came. <laughs> yeah. And I went, yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> be a way to go. Well, yeah, that's that's a good point, point, Rose. point quote. Uh, the Mark Twain quote, which is, uh, you go to heaven for climate and hell for society. Oh, <laughs> Somebody, yeah. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> but, I like um, what you said, Rose, because that I, I, I often have thought life is too incalculably expansive to just limit life to one life. You know, it's just it just seems like when you go, there's an afterlife. And then if you believe in reincarnation or not, which I do or multiple existences is a more specific. Although we, we don't know, nobody knows. Exactly, but what I'm getting at is, it just seems very limiting to live one life. Yeah. Because we all have things we would all like to have pursued. Pursued, pursued. yeah. Yeah, pursued, and um, things, you know, that we wish we didn't. So, I mean, it'd be nice if you had the opportunity to do different things and different versions of yourself. Just but don't you, don't you think too, I, I, I really like that idea too, I like that thought because 
um, you, you, you do, sometimes you do things like when I started to write, nobody in my family was a writer. No, nobody had done that before. And it was like, sometimes I think, so where did those ideas come from? Where did yeah. they come from? You know, yeah. is this an unfinished part of a, of, of, of a previous life of mine that I never got to experience that I'm going to get to experience now? Um, so there's a, I like, I really like the idea of reincarnation. I, I like that very much. I just wish that you would be able to remember. <laughs> Shirley MacLaine had, yeah, is that her, yeah, that actress, Shirley MacLaine. Yeah. Um, yeah, she, she you know, some people think they can remember, but there, it, it always makes me laugh though, because nobody was ever a okay. slave. Exactly. Everybody <laughs> was always... Cleopatra or, you know. Or Although I, I will say there was, there was a local fan who went through a phase where she would do past life regressions with people. And when she regressed my husband, in one, he was like a railroad magnate, but in another, he was a peasant fleeing a bunch of, you know. <laughs> and another person she regressed and she couldn't get anything much out of them. They kept saying, I'm looking around, there's, there's trees, I, I can't see anything. She was trying to get them grounded to figure out where they were, who they were. And so one thing she used to do is have them look down and describe the kind of shoes they were wearing because that was oh. a real tangible detail that would help. So after she tried for a while, this person is like, I don't know, I can't see it. You know, nothing tells me anything. She said, well, look down at your feet. And they said, I'm a duck. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, she, she's kind of like, um, what kind of duck? And they said, a white duck. And that sort of ended that regression. <laughs> if, you, if you guys ever watched That's the beautiful. British the British science fiction show Red Dwarf. Ah. Uh, you know, a rumor was um, Julius Caesar's chief eunuch or something. And the thing is, it's a funny line, but it was also kind of one of the most intellectually honest lives, lines. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, odds are you're more likely yeah. to be that. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a slightly different perspective, I think, because um, I, I came pretty close to death when I was 11 years old. Mm. And I would, for what it's worth, I think that there is a lot to be gained with making peace with the fact that this may be it. This may be the only life. Um, because I think one of the things that does, um, I mean, you can almost, it kind of leaves a tattoo on your psyche um, if you kind of have been through an experience like that at a certain age. You kind of, the sh safety bubble that most people kind of live in is shattered and it never really grows back. And you kind of become one of those weird people who, you know, people tell you about their tragedies and you're not the one who's like, oh my gosh, I can't imagine. You're just like, uh-huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, so-and-so's gonna die. You know, I really do genuinely feel sorry you, that you have to go through that. But at the same time, uh-huh. <laughs> like yeah. that's, you know, that that's that's the way it goes. And I watch so many people who struggle so much with fighting with themselves over choices that don't actually exist. Um, how many people I'm watching age who don't like the effects of aging it's like you understand there's two options you age or you die yeah and people are like what is your problem and i'm like no 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 that's just the i mean <laughs> <laughs> if, if you are torturing yourself with this idea that you could live for a very long period of time without any of the effects of aging why are you doing that to yourself yeah i mean that's not an option on the table why why are you doing that? and so it become you know it makes you that weird person who's just you know people try to have these deep conversations and you're like well that's not really an option <laughs> but um i mean i do think even though I am a devoutly religious person, to me, the afterlife is most interesting insofar in what it tells me about how to live today, not what is promised to me after. Because there may not be anything after. And, and whether or not it's actually true, I think there is something to be of value in making peace with the idea. Yeah. Are there any, um, I'm thinking about that, the. The, the people who either, you know, live their lives in that way. Can you think of any characters? Or for that matter, I mean, at this point, what the heck, you know, any people you know personally that you feel have really internalized that, that they really seem to be living their lives in a fuller way because of either their vision of the afterlife or how they have accepted the fact that afterlife or no, you know, there's there's a there's an expiration date on this one. Well, I've I've run into a few people who have had NDEs, um, 
and at least one of them I can think of right now is a pretty good friend. And, you know, they talk about it and they say just that, that they're trying to live their life uh, the best way. Um, so, I mean, I mean, I can just, I, I can use me as an example. I've never had a, a near death experience. I've had some weird stuff happen to me um, that I, I won't get into, but I mean, I, I just little weird things, including some, what I will say, reincarnational dreams. I had one progression I tried to do, which who knows if a progression, regression or whatever, sense of smell. But I, I really do feel that I'm, I'm doing the best. I have come to terms with, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be this or that by this time in my life, that I'm closer to dying than I was being born. Um, and I'm just living the best I can moment to moment. I mean, um, you know, my wife says I'm one of the happiest people she knows. Um, and I, I'm annoying that way. Even when I, I worked in the, I worked in a high tech field and believe me, I was annoying to a lot of people that didn't know how to crack a smile, but I didn't care. You know, I'm just going to be me, say, hi, smile. How you doing? That's your business. You know, that's your journey. But um, I just, I just live life moment to moment and I just enjoy what I'm doing especially now that I've retired, it's weird saying I'm retired because I still feel like I'm at the other end of that timeline mentally, but I'm good with it. I don't regret it. I look forward to, to the aging process and just live in my life and see what comes of it because I've been preparing for it my whole life, you could say, because I've been studying this since I was a preteen. I mean, I've just I mean, I've already thought about that. everything that people are just starting to think about. You know, I've been writing about it. Oh, I've been investigating it, researching it. You know, like Emily, I studied some philosophy, one course short of a double minor in it. You know, so I mean, I put a lot of thought into this and yeah, I'm good. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's funny how you said, you know, you would in a tech field that you were happy because I remember I had a friend who had a coworker who was happened to be sort of conventionally religious, but was always just so happy and cheerful. And apparently the boss told him at one point, you know what? I could have you tested for drugs anytime at HR. Ah. Like, <laughs> but, oh, I um, have been. You know? yeah. <laughs> what about what about some of the rest of you? Gene, Steve, Emily, thoughts? I guess one of the, the the problems with with where we are right now, um, there are so many things because I'm I'm like you, Frank. I, I, I know that I have more years behind me now than I have in front of me. Um, and there are a lot of things that I wanted to be doing like now, right now, which my, my husband and I, we wanted to start, we wanted to travel. We've had three cruises canceled on us. You know, I, it's, oh, just, like, it's just so um, frustrating to, to have things that you're ready and willing and able to do. And yet because of extenuating circumstances, you, you can't, you can't, you can't do them. Um, I have friends uh, that don't believe that this COVID thing is anything but a political hoax that, you know, after the election, it's all going to go away, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I wish that was true. I <laughs> wish it was true too, but I just, I can't, I'm having a hard time believing that, you know, I mean, especially here in Arizona where every day we get, you know, we have more people dying of this thing. And I just, I, I just, want to get back to real life so I can be like you, Frank. I've always been an optimistic person, but lately it's just like I'm having a really hard time coping <laughs> with, with where we are. <laughs> well, Gene, it's, it's a test of your mettle and you got to go around the rocks as much as well as you can Yeah, because it's not so much what gets thrown at you, it's how you deal with it. Oh, of course. It's, it's almost starting to feel like, you know, post-COVID is going to be like our little small afterlife. <laughs> it's like kind of we're in this new exactly. purgatory after life. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, give a thought there. Kind of I was saying bigger. we're kind of like in a purgatory right now. <laughs> right. Right. To me, it, you know, come with the defining moments of my life was, you know, again, going back to when I was 11, um, talking to the surgeon where we had a conversation where the surgeon finally figured out that he could just tell me that I might die. And what stands out to me about that isn't so much what it did for me is watching what it did for him that he felt mm. like okay now we can have a real conversation and I got the impression he had that conversation a lot of times with people who weren't willing to accept that 
Yeah. And he was he was having to walk a knife blade of like, okay, you know, dealing with people's philosophical and and existential fears and all of these things. And I felt like he and I were able to sit and just have a really good conversation and just seeing, you know, the burden come off him when he was able to tell an 11 year old kid of all. And I think it had to do with just not having as much experience with life and my, probably not as much investment as I think we get in our older um, years. And understanding that there's a freedom and acceptance is that, you know, the life is not fair. Being upset about that in the end of the day is not going to change the fairness of life. It's it's figuring out how to do the best that you can with what you've got. And, and the first step is understanding what you've got, which might be of a good long life with a lot of years when good health or not. I mean, I, I will say the, the one way in which at the moment, at least, life is still fair is that it ends the same way for everyone. <laughs> I and remember getting out of this alive. <laughs> yeah, so there was, there was a John Brunner um, book, Traveler in Black, where at one point um, people had to, you, know, you had to, they were saying it's a little place of bet. and say like where everybody can be equal. It's like, but what about rich men and women? Well, everybody can bet their head. It's like, and, and <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the same for everybody. Or the, or the, the t-shirt the, that says, he who dies with the most things is still dead. Yes, I like yes. that. <laughs> so somebody put a comment in the chat saying there was some recent Netflix movie, which I have not seen because I don't do Netflix, where a guy discovers there is an afterlife and it leads to mass suicide, which is yeah. interesting. And I've heard of that as a as a concept people have explored, like you know. Um, so that, that that would be in a in a philosophy though know, where killing yourself doesn't mean you don't go to a good place. Disqualify you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to come at a lot of this a different angle than you guys do because I'm not a believer in the afterlife. I'm not a believer that there's something else. I try to think of what would I do after I'm dead? I mean, really, do I have books? Do I have a job? What do I do? I like eating. You know, <laughs> I, I, what do I do? I mean, I can't imagine complete, contemplative non yo know, non existence doesn't non corporeal non existence yeah. Yeah. yeah so i mean I, I think i'll take a i think i'll take a you know a, a fade to black rather than uh rather than you know pain or or just non existence so the sitting on the cloud for playing a harp doesn't seem like heaven to you well or i could be with a bunch of uh you know mega church pastors <laughs> I do I want to be with that group? See, I, I think, well, I think the, in that case, it's not heaven that you've ended up in. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, the, the good one of the things that, that I, I wanted to kind of just throw a little bit of a literary thing back in here was because I, I do like urban uh, horror and I do like uh, uh, th th there, there's a concept of uh, necromancy, you know, raising the dead. So now some some books deal with that that you're just you're just reanimating you know the body you're not the 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 brain the spirit is not there others have like anita blake she in her early books yeah. raised the dead and talked to them and helped solve their murders that so i wanted to know where where that person was while they were dead <laughs> you know were they just like part of the, the body and asleep or were did they come in from someplace else i don't know i mean but that was kind of an interesting idea is that you could reanimate the dead and have them speak that's always been something on my mind too every time i've read anything like that or the current thing where you could freeze your i don't know if they still do that anymore freeze your head yeah or your eye or right. the whole yeah. body, if you're willing to pay. Or the whole yeah. body, but the last I heard it was a head. I, don't, I yeah. guess it got to the whole cheaper, body now. That's a cheaper version. Well, that's the cheaper. Yeah, the cheaper. <laughs> I mean, literally. <laughs> yeah. No, it would be, I would imagine, yeah. But still, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Right. Any that's test funny. runs? Well, <laughs> I mean, it's very Futurama. It's, where you I, know, head I know. And it's like, oh, here I am. It's like, talking but, head, right? Max head. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, but, but the more they find out about how memory and personality works, I mean, it's all so complicated. You know, it's the idea we'll just we'll just download it into the AI, which is sort of like yeah. Raptor of the Geeks. It's like, 
Well, I mean, the philosophical question that, you know, we don't yet have the framework to answer is, are you a monist or a dualist? Is everything about you explicable through material means? Are you anything more than your synapses firing? Is there a mind that is a separate thing? People who believe in this separate ghost type entity that animates your body are dualists. And, you know, we just, this is a philosophical question that doesn't have an answer, not because we lack the testing to be able to figure it out. We lack how to even frame such a test to be able to frame an answer. And I, I, that article I was reading uh, actually touched on that, where uh, one of the guys who had an MBE was a, was a medical doctor in the field. I can't remember what his name was. But um, what they did on some of the patients that had NDEs, you know, they knew they were dying and, and what, what else. They had them hooked up to all the various medical equipment. And they found that their brain activity was dead. There, were, there was no, no activity in their brain, yet they were still perceiving conscious. And then they came back and then... Yeah, well, there's that. some talk of that. There's some research initially hitting right. in that direction right whereas but also in dream state and semi-conscious states time does strange things uh, i mean if you actually look at the length of time that dreams take oh yeah it's tiny fractions of what you experience you know right but we're talking no activity, activity. Yeah. like one guy i think is i think it was the guy who had the medical background and that said um vortex i think was the term it was just dead there was no activity period he did stuff that involves the core. I don't, you know, I don't remember my what biology I had a lifetime ago, but you know, he did stuff that involved cortex-related type services, <laughs> and nothing was working. And then he came back. So I mean, he said, "Well, I got to deal with that now. I got to look, look into this." Basically, yeah. I uh, guess on the on the other side of it, I I remember um, when my when my mom died. Um, it was you could see, you could actually see the light go out of her eyes. I mean, it was like she was there one minute and then she was gone. She was gone, and then all that was left was the the hull. All that was left was the you know the husk of 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 the person. And I I just thought that was so. I was so pleased. Pleased isn't the word. I was just glad that I was there to experience that. I mean, I, I, I think it's really important. I, I always tell people who say that their parents are, are dying that they should, they should really try to be there for that because there is an experience. I mean, there is something there. You, you just see, you can see this, the spirit or whatever it is, leave the body. It's, it's just gone. It's just gone. So, um, you know, that I, it's, it's just a very moving, moving experience. Well, and and I'm I'm a I am a religious person, but I don't I'm not insulted by people who would argue that religion or the belief in the soul or whatever is a purely human construct, um, because I think people have a sort of strange opinions about what's real and what's not. When most of what matters the most to us in our human experience is not materially real. I mean, sure. the company we work for is not materially real. <laughs> <laughs> the government we pay taxes to is not. You know, it's it's got it's it's a structure in which we all conform our actions but there's no material you know notional construct right yeah, and yeah, and notional exactly. constructs are a big part of what it is to be human mm -hmm. so you know when people argue that's not real it's kind of like well i mean you're talking to a human being i mean if you're talking to a <laughs> robot maybe that's that matters but when you're talking to a human being there are very good and worthwhile and and life affirming answers to so what you know, if it's yeah, so, it's not real. <laughs> I have a question: yeah. When did when did we have something in us that survived into the afterlife? Was it when we were Homo erectus? Was it when we were, you know, 10, 10 million years earlier than that, or yeah. is it a recent? Thing? Or does it is, to debate? Did, and there are forms of dualism that um, everything's got some sort of immaterial aspect to it. So the more complex of a material thing you are, the more complex your immaterial thing is. But every even little, you know, just grabbing random objects. I mean, these all have some kind of immaterial persistent nature to them. Everything has energy. Everything is a virgin of energy. It is, it just is. Burn it, you know, you've released some energy. Yeah. Freeze it, whatever, everything's energy. 
Well, we're about 10 minutes out from the end of the thing. So um, I'm trying to think there's any general topics. Um, I don't know if we ever got all the way through. I think I remember um, Jean said she really liked defending your own life. I said the good place. I don't know if everybody, the good place. Yeah, any other um, dead like me, any other, I will say one, it's it wasn't exactly, ah, it wasn't exactly a depiction of an afterlife, it was more a description. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in Paul Anderson's book, Operation Chaos, which I remember very little of it, but this one little chunk really hit me where at one point they're talking about something and someone says something and they're saying, oh my gosh, are you being irreligious? And they're going, no, no. I mean, I'm not trying to say anything bad about the most high, if there is one, but they, they thought there'd be different ways of looking at it. Like if, if when you die, if, if your spirit is attracted to the goodness and you're allowed to approach, is that not heaven? If you're either not allowed or if you're not attracted that way, is that not hell? If you're not willing to leave and you go join another person's body, that'd be reincarnation. They're, they're, the, the take on it there was kind of like you sort of created your own afterlife by what you were attracted to, what you expected. And I thought, well, that's, that'd be an interesting thing. And the only other one I can think of in a, in a way, and it wasn't a book, it was my mother. At one point, she was at a convention talking with people about this. And, and she said, well, she really didn't know what the afterlife, if there was one, would be like, but she tended to figure we were about as capable of envisioning an afterlife and what it might be like as a fetus is of envisioning what the world is going to be like once they're squirted out. They have no conception. And when they first get out into it, they're not pleased <laughs> because it's so <laughs> different from what they're used to. But then they come out and hopefully they find an amazing world they could never have envisioned and she and she always said she hoped that's what the afterlife would be like something that she could not at all envision but that something that would be as amazing well i, I as hope life had been i hope the afterlife is not so discriminatory that it would uh filter out people who don't believe in it yeah i agree i don't think i don't think yeah. it would I think initially when we probably die, we're going to be dealing with our filters that we've still got with our conscious consciousnesses. And then we get kind of eased into whatever is out there. Because I think when we first die, I mean, that, that just seems like a, a consideration, even if it is a human, corporeal, physically oriented idea, construct, notional construct. Right. Um, it just seems like it might be an, an occurrence until we, you know, get our feet on whatever solid or whatever passes for feet. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're shown the way to that light, whatever is there. Yeah. But it just has to. I mean, I mean, when you look around you and see all the magnificence that we're, I mean, you know, filter out all the negative. because That's human created. You look at the magnificence we are living in. Look at look at Rose. I mean, look at the radiance. That's <laughs> I know, I know. I, mean, I love there, that. There has, love there that. has to be something yes. positive behind all this. Yeah. Because you know what? It could be false. It uh, really could be. And it's really of our making. Rose, I do like your virtual background, by the way. Yes. I, I downloaded it especially for this. Look, look. <laughs> no, oh, I know. It was perfect. Are you going to play Stairway to Heaven for us, too? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Break out the guitar. <laughs> yeah. 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 I've been downloading between. different Zoom images to kind of go along with panels <laughs> and such like. Because why not? I would change clothes for IRL. Might as well change my Zoom background. Um, yeah. We've got the we've go got ahead. a question in Q and A. Yeah, I, I, I was saw that answer. too. We have okay. a little we have a question in Q and A. Ah, oh. to your scattered Nancy Farmer. bodies go. And or and or river world. They're asking, what do we think about that? The whole river world to your scattered bodies go uh, motif. Well, that I have is, not you know, read technology. Yeah. Technology, uh, you know, indistinguishable from magic. Reanim bringing back, capturing souls and reanimating, recreating the bodies and and having them exist. So that's river world. 
<laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with Riverworld, so. Yeah, in, in Riverworld, yeah. people would die and then they would sort of like be reincarnated down the river. Oh, body. oh okay. <laughs> the river sticks. Big no. river kept on rolling. I don't know if this no, is it's, a, it's a river that it's a world that has just one long river with impenetrable mountains between. Uh, okay. Between them. And so it's along this river and you're reincarnated. There are uh, you're, you come to life naked with a pail. Uh, this pail is is what you use to collect food and, and things, and people recreate civilizations. Ah, hmm. oh. well, okay. And then Jim Henderson uh, here in Q and A has said everyone is resurrected when they wake up for the first time. It's an interesting reaction to an unexpected afterlife. Yes, <laughs> and and uh, that is an interesting point that a lot of uh, note how much of uh, fiction about afterlives. It has this concept of an unexpected afterlife. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I've ever really read a story of somebody waking up in an afterlife and being, oh, okay, now I know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's always an element of the unknown and the unexpected. And, the, yeah. and oh, oh crap, I, if I had known. You're right. <laughs> yeah, here, here I was expecting to fight all day and drink meat all night. And here yeah. I am playing a harp. What the heck is this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's actually a number of sort of like official afterlives that are supposed to be woohoo, like Valhalla. I'm going, oh my god, if I ended up in Valhalla, that would be like hell. Well, that's the good place. Actually, I thought did a really good job with that because it talked about how nowhere can be paradise if it's eternal. There's nothing that can be great enough <laughs> um, to keep working on. For I mean, and, and philosophers kind of argue back and forth about that. Um, often one of the kind of counter arguments is if there are ways to expand and grow your purpose, you know, whatever our little earthly purposes, if there's, if it's just a mere shadow of greater and greater purposes, uh, I mean, true in theory, I suppose I could go on for infinity, but I recognize that as the infinity that to me is like a little sideways eight. I don't really know what that means. <laughs> yeah. It's just like kind of a symbol that designates something I could tell you a few things about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did like the concept of the middle place. You know, yes, with one person. <laughs> one person. <laughs> then nobody can figure beer, out where she belonged, whether to go up or down. All the beer you can drink, but it's warm. You know. It's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and every and the only movie she has her Caddyshack and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the idea of an eternity of staticness. That yeah, that's that doesn't seem like heaven. You know, unless oh. unless you can somehow somehow your brain gets frozen so you don't notice it. Which still seems kind of creepy. No. Right? Yeah. Outside, when, when you're in it, you wouldn't notice. Yeah. But Neo didn't notice he was in a pod either because he was being controlled. Well, so. in, in the good place, and plug your ears, anyone who doesn't want the end of the good place spoiled. But the person who does stay in existence eternally is the person who is the creator, the creative person who is always learning new crafts or whatever, and and finally, rather than move on into non-existence goes on to creating better afterlife experiences and whatever lies beyond that. And I, you know, I thought that was a very interesting, I, I, I mean, I think that was kind of obvious that writers wrote that because <laughs> this person was basically the ultimate writer, <laughs> always creating new worlds and new ideas and things, but yeah. All right. Well, we're just, a, we're just almost at time. So last thoughts of any kind, um, Starting with Emily. Um, okay, well, so I'll just go ahead and show my books again. Um, it's a trilogy. Um, and, you know, it's a, I hope that enough of my philosophy and religious background are in there to make it interesting. Just to be an interesting playground um, to, to set and it, I'd say it's urban fantasy, except it takes place in Taos, which isn't terribly urban. Suburban. Like, yeah, rural so. fantasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Frank. Okay, well, um, all my work does have uh, deeply weird and um, uh, like paranormal or uh, supernatural. Uh, conspiracy theories that all kind of weave in and out of each other. Uh, the Uninvited is one about 
mass murder and how they're all related. You, you know who did everything, but how they're all related in kind of a reincarnational way. And then this is my metaphysical, straight metaphysical book, Sleepwalkers, about a road trip in your dreams. And then this has a little bit of everything in it. Science fiction, horror, um, weird. But my beliefs, I try not to be preachy and try to be as you know transparent as Stephen King thinks it should it be when you're a writer um but uh you you'll definitely read some weird stories and i think we just need to be open to the weird in our lives and and uh do the best we can because that's all you can ask the best person you can be thanks rose for hosting this today. no thanks gene yes that's what i was gonna say too thank you for being our moderator <laughs> and my my sci-fi um adventure um and I and I also wanted to say that I think is it the book bar has our books and Broadway Book Mall has our books. So if anyone out there is interested in checking out anyone, any one of our uh, the authors, um, that's where you could go. And Rose, this was great fun, and thank you so much for being a, a great moderator. And I never thought that I would enjoy a virtual con, but that I have learned that this year. Virtual cons can be pretty much fun. <laughs> Not as fun as a hug, like you said originally, but um, you know, we we make do. <laughs> well, it's kind of like somebody was saying in the chat last night. It's like a, you know, Zoom is better than Discord, but real life is better than Zoom. <laughs> but you know, it's not like we're saying, oh, I'm not gonna do real life, I'll do Zoom. So, you know, like like yeah. Emily said, that's not on the table right now. So, you know, enjoy what you got while you got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what you got to wrap us up for here? Well, I one thing I like about the virtual thing is I could have a cup of my tea <laughs> while on the panel. And I also like that, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, so that that is nice. I miss I miss the 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 noise of humanity. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have that here. All, all I have are the noise of relatives, and that's, that's <laughs> annoying. <laughs> yeah, very true. I take it sounds like your relatives aren't human. You... Barely. <laughs> <laughs> So are, are any of you now inspired, other than Frank, to uh, maybe write something that will incorporate either an afterlife or people musing about afterlife or? I think it's going to make me muse about it more <laughs> <laughs> than I have before. <laughs> uh, like you get your your sort of undead afterlife character. Right, right, right. <laughs> and are vampires having an afterlife? Is, is that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they're having yeah, I mean, their, their life i think <laughs> yeah and in vampire fiction is that the person or is it a demon that takes over the body yeah i mean get a, all kinds of really wacky afterlife stuff okay. i even got into that in something like buffy where it's like yeah. you know, they were saying it's like she came back kind of wrong you know it's like a pet cemetery <laughs> exactly. Going on here. exactly yeah <laughs> Or yeah. when Willow comes back and they're like, oh, and she's like, I'm kind of gay. And, and people are like, the vampire personality has nothing to do with the human personality. And Angel's like, actually, he looks around yeah. and he's like, yeah, yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could have spent a whole a whole panel talking about Buffy. In the oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe next year we will. Who knows? Good, good, good. I good. Was I'll, a panel watch it. Buffy. I'll volunteer for that one too. <laughs> Vampires in the afterlife. Um, yes. Meg, are you listening? I can. Uh, well, so I was going to say, after we wrap up here, if anybody wants to slow, slope over, the closing ceremonies are going. Okay. Uh, there will be the onions and orchids panel later for people to talk about <clears throat> ideas they think people did well, badly, could do better. Uh, we are thinking of doing at least some element of virtual next year, although hopefully it will be in parallel to the real life. Yeah. But a lot of people have said, there's elements of the virtual that they would like to see continue, yeah. particularly those people that can't make it here in the yeah. flesh. Yeah. Right. So a couple things, and we're going to hopefully have a virtual dead dog tonight. Oh. <laughs> so if any of you can make that, that'd be great. But I think I think we've pretty much come to the end here. So Mindy, in a minute, we're going to wrap up. But I just want to say thanks to all of you so much. Um, you've been great panelists. I have loved seeing you here at the con 
and um, and at this panel. Uh, Thanks for well, moderating, Rose. Thank you, Rose. Rose. Everybody it else, great to fun. see y'all. Nice to meet all of you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.